Our reading this morning is in John chapter 8, verse 12 to 36. If you've got a church Bible, uh, it starts at page 1125 and flips over to the next page. Um, but it will be on the screen behind me, so you can follow along. Um, so starting at verse 12, chapter 8. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him, Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, Where is your Father? You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words whilst teaching in the temple near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Once more Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? they asked. Just what I have been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So we're looking at this series where we're looking at the conversations that Jesus had on earth as John recorded them. You remember we've spoken about the fact that John's gospel was one that was written slightly differently from the others. It has a different approach. It's a very personal relationship style of gospel. And Pastor Phil started the series by looking at Nicodemus. Remember that name? We're going to come back to him later on. And with Nicodemus, the conversation was about what does it mean to be born again? Then we looked at the Samaritan woman at the well, about finding a meaning to life. And last week, Pete took us through the conversation with the disciples about the bread of life and the importance of who Jesus was and how you could live on him and feed from him. And today we're moving on to the conversations recorded in John chapter 8, starting at verse 12. And I thought I'd better think about what is a conversation. So I went to the Oxford English Dictionary, because I felt that was a good place to go for definitions, and it says that a conversation is an informal talk involving a small group of people of at least two. Now that caused me a problem to start with, because as Jim will tell you, last week I was walking around the church office talking to myself. I often have conversations with myself, I find they're better, there's less argumentation, there's less disagreement, and generally I actually understand what I'm saying to myself. Now a number of you are obviously looking as though you feel the same way, and we'll probably come back to that on the way through, but conversations, informal talks with more than one person... 
There are all kinds of conversations, aren't there? Social conversations. How are you doing? How's your week been? What are you planning this weekend? What are you up to? There's something to get a little bit more personal. How's your work going? How, how's your health? And then there are others which are what I'd call spiritual conversations. They're about where do you stand with God? And they may be between Christians about how are you getting on? How's your Bible reading going? How's your prayer life? How are you doing? Or it might be between you and a non-Christian where you're saying, actually, have you thought about these things? Have you ever thought about where you stand with God? There's all kinds of conversations, but generally they're not supposed to be with yourself, apparently. Never mind. But John recorded this conversation. Now, we're told in the Bible that if we recorded everything that Jesus said and did when he was on the earth, there would be insufficient room on the earth to hold the books. So why did John choose this one? Why did he record this one and not some of the others? Why is this one important? Well, that's what I want to look at. But first of all, I think, before you get into that, we need to think about the where and when of this conversation. You see, I think there are times and places to have deep conversations, and there's time and places not to have them. Could I suggest that whilst I'm preaching is probably the one not to have them in? But that's up to you. You may get bored and decide to go and have a conversation. If so, take it outside the church. But I think it's fairly rare that people, a complete stranger, will walk up to you and ask you about where do you stand with God? What do you mean? What is Jesus about? There needs to be some kind of relationship, some kind of bridge building. We live in a really busy world, don't we? It's easy. I mean, I find it. I jump in my car. I drive out on my road. I head off to work. It's rare these days I find myself actually having a long conversation with my neighbours. Now, I got to this point in the nine o'clock service, and as I looked up, just about where... John was sitting, I saw my neighbour from down the road sitting. And I thought, oh, I've never seen him at church before. It turns out that his son is learning to play drums with Ryan. And so he'd invited to talk about the music group and he came along to see what we were like. And I thought, hmm, that's awkward, isn't it? That's an interesting place to be at in your sermon and suddenly you find that one of your neighbours is sitting there when you say you don't actually talk to them and you don't know them very well. <laughs> Preacher, preach to yourself, perhaps. Right, well, there we go. But do we find it easy to make that link? Now, I'm a fairly unsociable person, if I'm honest. I'm not into sports. In quite a big way, I'm not into sports. And so I find that to build that relationship with people and to find that link, to be having those conversations where something can come on can be hard work, and it's something I have to make a deliberate choice to do. And we're going to come back to that later on. But Jackie tells me that she walks away from the Portsmouth football ground yesterday in a happy mood, that she can talk to complete strangers about how the match has been, what the quality of the refereeing was like, apparently, gets discussed, the quality of the strikers, the quality of the defence, and, of course, the manager. So it, with that link there, with that common ground, they can have a conversation. So we, I think we need to look at what the build-up to this conversation we're looking at this morning is all about. Now, we need to go back a chapter or so to get the background to this. John chapter 7 tells us all about the fact that this is at the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Shelters or the Feast of Booths. You might have it called different things depending on what version of the Bible you're looking at. But it's a seven-day festival, a Thanksgiving festival celebrating the harvest coming in, but in which they remind themselves that for 40 years they were in the wilderness, living in tents, relying on God for their food. And it's quite, it's the largest of the Jewish festivals that happen through the year. I must admit, as I was looking at this, I think, well, as a church, we often seem to revolve things around food, but it seems like the Jews did that as well. Now, the disciples went up early ahead of Jesus, and there was a reason for that, because they knew that the Jews, and by that they're referring to the Jewish leaders, were looking for Jesus. They were asking, where is that man? They wanted to find him and trap him. So Jesus doesn't turn up to halfway through the feast. So that brings me back to this question of timing. We need to be sensitive as to when it is God wants us to have conversations. I've said earlier on that I've got a fairly big mouth, and with my big mouth goes my big foot, and I have the ability to stick the two together very closely in conversations with people. And I often find that when I want to go and talk to somebody, I pick the wrong moment. They're in the middle of something else. Or, actually, it can be the other way around. I can be busy at work, and someone comes up to talk to me about, oh, what were you doing at the weekend? Because I'm halfway through a cost report and trying to get the figures to balance-ish, kind of, give or take a million or so, um, that I say, oh, yeah, it was all right, really, I didn't do much, and I blank the conversation. 
We need, as Christians, to be sensitive to God's leading about the timing of conversations and have those conversations at the right time when he wants us to be having it. So Jesus has gone up there and he's begun to teach. Now this is where I think we're different to the other conversations we've looked at so far. They've been out away from the temple. They've been out in the open. They've often been with an individual or just a few people. Here, Jesus is actually at the temple and he's preaching to a crowd. Not only the Jewish public, but also the Jewish leaders. So the Jewish leaders come to him and they say, what right have you to start preaching like this? What right have you to be telling us the way we interpret scriptures is wrong? What right have you got to tell us the rules and regulations we have are wrong? And Jesus, in chapter 7, comes back with this reply. My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. Now, the reason I picked that verse out to look at in particular is we're going to see that theme coming up again and again in the passage we're looking at. And it's a really important theme. It's really important when we go out, we are preaching what God wants us to preach. So, this is the claim that Jesus made. And we know it upsets everybody because the Jews make the comment like this. Isn't this the man they're trying to kill? The Jewish public know that the Jewish leaders are trying to find Jesus, seize him, and kill him. They want to discredit him. And through the rest of chapter 7, in fact, the beginning of chapter 8, you see that. Now, one of the reasons I haven't started at the beginning of chapter 8 is because a lot of the early versions of the Bible do not have verses 1 to 12 in them. So that's something that's been added in later. So we start at that point. But before we leave chapter 7, just one little thing I want to draw your attention to. Nicodemus, remember where our conversational series started, is talking to the Pharisees, and he has this really important point to make. Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? Isn't it easy for us to jump to conclusions, for us to make assumptions? Oh, I think so-and-so must be doing that, or saying that, or I've heard around the grapevine that this is happening. The Bible tells us we need to find the truth of these out. We need to ask the person directly. We need to get involved with it. Church life is full of activities. Things that go up, things that go down, things that change, people that go up, people that go down. It's easy for people to hear half a story and make judgments based upon it. So, it's really important. First of all, the conversation takes place at the right time, in the right place. So if you're listening to me this morning, can I ask you, as a Christian, have you ever sat down and decided to have a conversation with someone about what you believe? Now, sometimes they can be in the strangest of places, not when you're expecting them. I can remember, I used to drive coaches for Oak Hall, a Christian holiday company, and I can remember coming back about two o'clock in the morning, and someone said, well, I've had a really good holiday away with you guys, but what is it all about? What is it you really believe? And two o'clock in the morning, we had that conversation. I was concentrating on the road, I was staying awake, But that was when God brought that person to have that conversation. Now, I said the other week, often when I'm driving, people think about death, and it wasn't really because of that. But um, we've got to be awake. We've got to be alert. We've got to be listening to what God's leading us. And if you're one of these people who hasn't become a Christian, you haven't made that statement, and you may have been coming here for years, or you might have been in a few weeks, you may have read bits of the Bible, you may not have done. Can I ask, what it is that stops you becoming a Christian? Have you actually thought about what is it that holds you back? And have you gone and had a conversation with someone about those issues, those concerns? Because if you never ask the questions, you're never going to hear the answers, are you? And this is too important a thing to just let it drift, to let it carry on. So perhaps today, at the end of this service, if you're still awake, you want to nudge... Oh, a couple of you are still awake, good. You, you might want to nudge someone, talk to the person who brought you, talk to somebody else, come and talk to me if you're really desperate, talk to the music group, talk to people at the prayer team. It's the time to have that conversation, perhaps, for you. Find a place where you're comfortable, where you can open up, where you can have a conversation. Could I suggest that sometimes in the hustle and bustle at the back of church isn't the right place? You might need to bring someone down to the front have that conversation. You might want to take someone to your home and talk to them quietly. You need to be sensitive as to when God is leading you, but don't delay having a conversation when God wants you to have one. Don't miss out on what God has to offer, is what I'm saying. So, as I said, we've looked at the where, we've looked at the when, and we need to look at what the conversation is about.
So Jesus is speaking to the people, and as I said, the people are not just a few disciples. It's the crowd in the temple. It's open to the public. Any Jew could be there. And he comes up with this statement, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So why did he pick that particular example, that illustration? Well, we go back to the fact it's at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And at this time, as well as living in the temples, they would have enormous bowls of oil, about 16 of them, filled with oil, lifted up in the temple and set alight about 75 feet above the ground. Now, we live in a world where light is very uh, easy for us to access. We turn on a switch, we turn on the car, we have glare from screens, from our phones, from our laptops, from our mobiles. But that didn't exist in these days. The world would have been dark, apart from the light of the stars and the moon at night. And light is important. Jesus is saying here that he was able to take the scriptures and illuminate them, to take the Old Testament and make them relevant to the people who are listening to him and show that he fulfilled them. So why is light important to us? Well, the Greek word is this. Not this, it's pronounced for us, but it's about as good as my Greek gets. I thought I'd put it in your bulletins for you, so you have to try and write it down. And it's actually a little bit more than we tend to think of as light. A lot of the Greek words are like that. It's defined as a light, but anything that emits light, reflects light, or is a brightness. When God says, I am light, it's saying he is light. Not just that he reflects it, but he is light. If you think about the word light, L-I-G-H-T, light leads us. It lets us see where we're going. It illuminates. It not only illuminates where we're going, it illuminates things in our lives that we perhaps don't want to be seen. You know, if you go into a dark room and you're looking for something, you turn the light on. Now, sometimes that's good because it illuminates the things we should be doing but sometimes it's illuminating bits that we don't like. It illuminates the dirt, the dust, the cobwebs, those spiders that as far as I put them outside the house seem to come back into the house. And God's light is like that. It shines into our lives and it illuminates the good bits, but it also shows up the bits which are wrong. It guides us. As I said, you know, you can have light on a ship, for instance. So if you're coming in, you're looking for a, a lighthouse or a marker light that guides you on the right path. Light heals. If we don't sit out in the sunshine, if we don't get light, then we suffer physically as well as mentally. Light can target. You can see a light shining up a target. Light shows us where we're going. That's the kind of stuff that light does. Now, every day the sun rises to provide warmth, illuminate and provide growth on earth. You'll know, because I've mentioned it a few times in the pulpit, that I'm not the world's best, keenest interested in gardening. But even I understand that if there's no light, the plants in the garden don't grow. The moon and the stars light the night, serving as navigators long before there was sat nav or anything else around. They're important guides. As we learn things from the Bible, it sheds more light on what we know about God and what we understand about him. And we're going to come back to the importance of the Bible time and time again in this talk. Light permeates into any, everything where it's not blocked. If you don't block a light from shining, then it shines automatically. It goes everywhere. I'm standing here with a ray of lights on me. You know, if somebody was to go up there and put something in front of them, it would stop, but it has to be physically blocked. Light makes things manifest, evident, exposed or clear, said John Piper. And that's important for us to think about when we're thinking about what light does in our lives. We are exposed to the light of God through believing in him. And it changes our lives. It really opens up our lives and makes us think about things. Because Christ is the light of the world. God is light. Christ created light. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Matthew Henry put it, one sun enlightens the whole world. So does one Christ in light of the whole world and the whole of time. And there needs be no other. So Jesus is saying that he is the one who's going to show people their, what their sin is and will lead the correct way back to God. 
He's challenging the rulers that their approach is wrong, and he's the one who's come to reveal God's plan to the world. Now, sometimes I think when we're having a conversation, we, we, we try to be a little bit nice and pleasant. We don't like doing the confrontational, unless you're awkward and stubborn like I am. And sometimes that isn't right. We have to be bold, and we have to challenge people in the right way as God leads us. So Jesus has made a bold claim about the fact he's the light of the world. He's the only one who can show people what the truth is. And he gets challenged, and the Pharisees challenge him, say, what right have you? Who do you think you are? What authority have you got? You're just a carpenter's son. Now, you're probably aware that under Jewish law, that if you're going to make a legal statement and take someone to court, you had to have more than one person talking about it. You needed to have two or three witnesses. And this was something that had been enshrined back in Deuteronomy and right the way through. And let's be honest, it's something we follow these days, isn't it? If you go to a court, you often hear the witnesses, the eyewitnesses' testimony about what is said, what is done. It needs to be confirmed by at least one other witness. And Jesus is standing there making these claims and they're saying, you can't talk like that. You've got no one to support you. But Jesus has the answer for that. He says, even if my testimony... Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and I know where I am going. Now there's a real word of confidence for you, isn't it? He knew he came from heaven. He knew he was going back to heaven. That's the God we're talking about, the God we speak about. So when we're out talking, having our conversations, do you have that confidence? Do you know where you came from? But more importantly, do you know where you're going to? But there is a little... Um, note on here, isn't there really, where he says, you've got no idea where I came from or where I'm going. And I think we need to remember, particularly those of us who've been in church for a long time, and I went to church at six weeks old, so I'm a few years, a couple of years, 40 or 50 years, um, that we get in the habit of using terminology, phraseology, sentence structures, words that other people don't understand. And I have to say that for me, I have to be careful that I don't end up using stuff that people won't understand what I'm talking about. We've got to find ways of explaining the greatest mystery in the world in words that people can comprehend. But we're helped with that, as we're going to see later on. See, we need to have that certainty about where we've come from, where we're going, what we're talking about. But we also need to be sensitive to the person we're talking to. Where have they come from? It might be someone who's been in church for a long time, or it might be somebody who's never been in church before in their lives and doesn't understand anything. I find, and uh, maybe my age, as I talk to the younger people in the, my office, their lack of understanding of what I would call the basic Christian story, I find frightening. You know, I, th I think I've mentioned before that I've got a lad in my office who didn't realise that Jesus at Easter is the same Jesus as is mentioned at Christmas time. You know, and that's... You've got to start from real basics when you're talking to people. You've got to be at their level so they can understand what you're talking about. So do you, when you get the opportunity, do you pitch it for the right audience? Do you do it with authority? Do you know your scriptures? Do you know your Bible? Do you know where to find the verse that you need? Yes, God will help you, God will lead you, but he actually expects you to have done some of the basic groundwork in the first place to understand how the Bible works, where it goes to. It's good if you're talking about Christian things that you can support it with your own testimony, what God's done for you personally, but that must never, ever be in the place of God's gospel. Your, your witness supports it. It doesn't take over the gospel. See, what he says here is about judgment. You judge by human standards, but I judge, if I judge, my decisions are right because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. I think the church in this world is losing a lot of its impact and effectiveness because church leaders are trying to talk in their own authority they go with what they fancy, what they like, what's popular, what fits in with the common culture in today's modern culture of the world. We're not called what, to preach what is popular, we're called to preach the gospel. The fact that all have sinned, that God sent his son to save us, and if we believe in him, we will be saved and spend eternity with him. A few weeks back, Chris Thomas from Eastney was up in this pulpit, and he spoke a lot about church unity. And not only church unity within a church, but working with other churches. And on the door, I was challenged by a couple of visitors that day who'd been here, who come from a church, not in the immediate area, but outside about, um, would we support them as a church? And I was talking to them a little bit, and it came to light that as a church, they were about to have a series of same-sex marriages. 
And as, as a church, we would support you in terms of your witness, in terms of preaching the gospel. We couldn't support you in this situation. And that is why, without relying on our own judgment, we have to look at what the Bible says and stand firm by that. Their comment was, well, given that you're so old-fashioned and so stick in the mud, how on earth do you get so many people into the church? And I said, it's because we preach the Bible. The Bible is the only authority we preach from. It's the only authority we have to preach. And when we're having our conversations and when we're talking to people, that must be what we're basing our talks about. So, I'm on a little bit off track there. Back to our passage. Oh, by the way, if you're trying to follow this in the outline, I have a confession to make. I've just realised I should have done this at the beginning. I wrote the outline about two weeks ago because it had to be printed before last weekend. Since then, I've rewritten my sermon three times. So it may... <laughs> May not follow exactly, but there we go. So in your own law, it's written, the testimony of two men is valid. I am the one who testifies myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Now, throughout the Gospel stories, you read the Bible, you see Jesus time and time again refers to the fact that he does things in the name and in the power, in the authority of the one who sent him. It's really important that, as I said before, we need to make sure we are speaking on God's authority, not our own. So they come back to the fairly obvious question, I guess, well, who is your father? As far as they're concerned, Jesus' father was a carpenter out in Galilee, did a little bit of carpentry work called Joseph. They didn't know where he'd come from. And so they ask a question, and Jesus replies to it. If you knew me, you would know my father also. There's only one way to know God the Father. And that is to know Jesus the Son. And if you know Jesus the Son, you will know Jesus the Father. And if you truly know them and follow them, you'll know Jesus the Son, Jesus the Father, and God, the Holy Spirit. The three are combined, the Trinity. If you don't know Jesus as your Saviour, you're not really going to know the Father. But Jesus is still talking in the temple courts, and... Um, He's got to talk a little bit. He needs to challenge them. He needs to try and explain things to draw them on. So he brings up this. He says, I'm going to go away and you will look for me and you will die in your sins. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? You're going to die in your sins. And we're going to come back to that because it's really important about the fact that there's only one way to move away from dying eternally. But the Jews didn't understand it. They assumed that was going to make him kill himself and that he was going to go out and do that and they wouldn't better follow him through death. And whilst it is his death he was talking about, he was talking about it in a totally different way. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit that people can understand the things of Scripture. We can talk about them, we can explain them, but it is, we have to remember it's God's work, God's Holy Spirit, that opens up people's hearts and minds to what's being said. He has to remind them that he's thinking about things from a heavenly perspective, not an earthly perspective. Now, I often find that Jackie and I have had a conversation and we haven't quite understood each other because we've come at it from two totally different points of view. I understand that we're starting from one point, she understands we're starting from another. And it's the same here. If we're not approaching things in the same way, people won't understand what we're talking about. So Jesus goes on to repeat, not only his warning, but his claim. I told you you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die for your sins. Now I've put the, the one I claim to be in brackets, because if you go back to the earliest versions of the scripture, you'll find that, that isn't in there, and the I am is the Old Testament I am, where God says I am. So he is saying, I am God, I am Jehovah. I am the Messiah, that is a real thunderbolt of a claim to make in front of all the Jewish leaders, isn't it? But it's the basis of what our gospel is based upon, because if Jesus isn't God, then the rest of it falls away. So when Jesus stands there and says, I am God, I am God the Father, I am God the Son, he is making a claim that's really fundamental to the belief. What he is saying is that you will die. The only way to be saved and to have eternal life with him is to be with him. Now, conversations are not just statements. They're not just monologues. They're two-way. 
And so the Jewish people come back with another question for him. Who are you, they asked. Seems a sensible question. And Jesus replies, just what I've been claiming all along. Now, have you ever had a conversation with someone where you feel as though you're repeating yourself time and time and time again? Because something that's perfectly obvious to you, they just clearly haven't grasped. But they're asking about who was Jesus. I don't know why you're laughing, Jackie. Well, I do, actually. <laughs> but, you know, it's... You feel as though you're going round and round in circles, don't you? But why is it that people think Jesus are? So I did a little Google search. Here's some things that people think Jesus are. He was a good teacher. He was a good man. He helps people in trouble. He was a terrorist trying to usurp the Roman authorities. He's a rebel leader. He was a prophet. It doesn't matter because he's dead anyway. It's important to know who Jesus is. Important to be able to know that you have a relationship with him if you're going to tell other people about him. Jesus keeps repeating it. See, I know in some panel games you get penalised if you have hesitation, repetition or pausing. Fortunately not when you're preaching. But why does Jesus repeat this statement time and time again? Because it's important. He has come from God the Father. He's not doing this his own right. He's doing it because he is God, God's son. And he has come that we might be saved. But still, the Jews didn't understand that he was telling them about his father. He goes on in verse 28 to talk about what's going to happen to him. When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you'll know who I claim to be. He's talking about being crucified. But I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. I prayed earlier on about the fact that we have a tremendous privilege and freedom in this country to be able to talk about Christian things. We're not going to be martyred, persecuted. We're not going to be imprisoned because of what we say. I wonder if that was the situation over here, as it is for many Christians around the world, how many of us would still be sitting in this pulpit? How easy it would be to not be in this church? How easy it would be not to preach? How easy it would be not to talk about things? Do we have the confidence and the certainty of God that he is leading us, that we'd be able to talk even if we're in a time of persecution, even to death? It's important to remember that we don't have to do it in our own strength. See, what Jesus says is, the one who sent me is with me. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. So, Christian, when you're out having that conversation that you may or may not have been expecting, it turns to Christian things, and you get the opportunity to talk about what it is you believe. More importantly, who it is you believe in. You're not doing it by yourself. You have the Holy Spirit there to help you, support you, guide you. Notice the last little bit there. I always do what pleases him. God is pleased when we talk about him. He doesn't like it if we don't do that. You know, and if you want to know God's blessing, God's reward, God's support in your life, you actually have to step out and have those conversations. Much as you might not believe it, sometimes I find talking to people quite difficult. And to find the right words to say, to find the right things to say, my mouth goes dry, my hand goes sweaty, I start shaking, I think, what am I going to say next? And I have to pray, and I have to seek God's help. I have to seek God's help not only for me, but the person who's listening to me will actually understand what it is I think I'm saying. So when you go out, those conversations, pray. Even while you're talking, pray. Because you need God's help. You need God's Holy Spirit. So we then move on to why Jesus is having this conversation. So he's there, he's talking to the Jewish leaders, he's talking to the Jewish people, he's spoken about the fact that he's the light of the world, that they're in darkness, that they need to be saved. And we know it's effective because verse 30 tells us that even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. And that's good, that's important, that's what we want to see as a church, we want to see people coming to know Christ as their saviour, that's the reason we're here. But it's not just enough to believe, you see. Because Jesus carries on. That if you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciples. That means followers, studiers, people who go alongside. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, it's not just enough to believe. You have to move on from that. It's not just enough to teach a child to, be, to toddle. They need to learn how to walk, to eat, to grow, to develop. 
And that's really what being a disciple is about. See, James says this, you believe there's one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You know, it's really easy to say, oh right, someone's become a Christian, isn't that great, and forget about them. But actually it's the rest of the steps. It's the moving them on, helping them develop, helping them grow, helping them study. And that's something that everyone in the church has a role to play in. See, what Jesus is looking for is someone who's got an active faith, someone who obeys his teaching. And this understanding of God's truth is what really will set you free. Now, I'm going to go to this next verse, and I'll stick up there. We know that the Jews had been slaves in Egypt. You remember the story of Moses going to pull him out across the Red Sea, 40 years in the wilderness, all the rest of it. What they'd just been remembering at this Feast of Tabernacles. Yet they come back and say, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. At this time, according to the commentators, there was this move that the Jews had decided to put themselves in slavery because it was better for them as a land and as a people. That God hadn't had anything to do with this and they hadn't really been slaves. It had been something they'd chosen to do and when they were ready, they decided to leave. They were fooling themselves. But isn't it easy to do that? We believe in our own strength, our own abilities, our own capabilities, rather than relying on God. So they're saying, how can you say we'll be set free? We don't even think we're enslaved. We're our own people. Don't worry about the fact that Romans are occupying the land. We're not really slaves. And this imagery is something that Jesus takes on, and it's quite important. Because he says that anyone who's slaves, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, I was talking in the first service, and uh, I'll, I'll, t- I'll use the same example again. It's not one I think applies to anybody here, but when I worked in a place some years back, there was a guy who had a real problem with gambling. To the extent that his salary had to be given to his wife, and she would give him just enough money for the day. And I remember talking to him once and saying, well, what can't you just put the money in your pocket, keep it there, can't you deal with it? He said, no, as soon as I wake up, I'm trying to see what the horse racing's going to be. I need to be down at the gambling shop. I need to be placing that bet. This addiction, this sin, was really taking over his life. He was a slave to it. Now, we may not be so extreme, we may not be in that kind of area, but all of us, if we're not followers of Christ, we have something that we're a slave to. It might be possessions, it might be belongings, it might be your status at work, it might be, I don't know, being able to play the piano fantastically. It might, I don't know what it is, but there'll be something that really motivates you, drives you. You're a slave to it. But the interesting thing is that someone who's a slave has no permanent place in the family. They're a possession, they're bought, they're sold, they're moved around, they get old, they're discarded. But if you join a family, if you belong to a family, be adopted in, as we are as Christians, we're adopted into God's family, you belong to it forever. See, what he said several times is you're going to die in your sins. And we believe, and we preach from this pulpit time and time again, that everybody in this world is going to have eternal life. The choice you have to make is where you're going to spend that eternal life. Are you going to spend it in heaven with the family of God and Christ and God, in his presence forever? Or are you going to spend it in hell, which is the only other alternative? If you belong to God's family, then you're going to spend eternity with God in his family forevermore, praising, worshipping and being with him. Whereas a non-believer won't be. So Jesus comes towards the end of this and he says, "So so if the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. He comes back to the theme, I am the only way, he says. Jesus is the only way to be set free from sin, the only person who can save you, the only person who can draw you back to God. It's a really important decision to make, isn't it? It's a really important conversation to have. Where do you stand with God? So, again, I'm going to sort of, as we come to an end and we start to think about what it is we learnt, one of the things I've learnt from my home group, which has an eclectic group of people in it, I'd say, is that we can all listen to the same sermon, but we all end up with very different interpretations about what was actually said. Um, Yeah, sometimes it's quite challenging how people heard what they heard, but never mind. I've preached a sermon. I've I've gone through this passage. What is it you've heard? Only you can really fill that bit in on your sheet. But I'm going to come up with a few ideas, a few thoughts that might 
um, remain in your mind. A meaningful conversation rarely starts from nothing. So Christians, what are you doing to build up relationships with others so that God can use you to have conversations with them? It's really easy to get involved in the church, isn't it? I worked out the other day that in two weeks I'd, spent, I'd had two nights away when I wasn't doing church things. And OK, I'm talking to people at work, but in terms of people in my community, all my work is the other side of Southampton and, you know, what people from Southampton are like. Um, I go to the bus museum and I try to talk to people there. But it's really easy to get trapped just being in church, isn't it? So what are you doing to build up meaningful relationships so you can have discussions with people outside the church? When are you going to have that conversation? Are you listening to when God's calling you to go and see somebody? Somebody put someone on your mind, you think, you know what, I'll give them a phone call or I'll go and see them. Are you available for God to use you? If you're not a Christian, can I ask you, you know, to have a think about those things that are stopping you becoming a Christian. What is stopping you making that final step? Find someone today. Have that conversation. Talk to them. Look for some answers. He is waiting to set you free, but there's a time and place for that conversation. And if you miss it, you may miss your opportunity. What are your conversations going to be about? Now, we're about to go and have tea, coffee, biscuits, if I get to them early enough. And we'll probably talk about all kinds of things. Have you had a good week? What are you doing? Wasn't this nice? Oh, what was the weather like this morning? But actually, are you also going to make sure that you have a chance to talk about things on a spiritual level? Are you going to ask what people think about God? Is your conversation about the church, in the church, with Christians, encouraging and supporting, or is it negative? It's very easy in church life to find all the things that are wrong. Oh, don't like the chair colours, don't like the chair cushions, don't like the music, it was too fast, it was too slow, it was too loud, it was too soft. The preacher went on too long, he could have spoken for longer. No? There's all kinds of things you can complain about in a church, isn't there? Let's make a positive effort to keep our conversations positive, encouraging, supportive, a witness to God, not something that damages his reputation. Are you able to talk about Christian things with the backing and authority of Scripture? I've said before that, yes, we all our own witnesses are good. We can talk about things God's done for us. If we can't use the Scripture, if we don't know the Bible, then we're not able to talk properly with God's authority. Don't rely on your own experiences. They can be easily distorted. This one's another one for me, one where I have to preach to myself. Are you actually listening to the questions being asked, or are you just talking for the sake of it? I find it really easy to have a conversation. Somebody asks a question and I talk about the things I wanted to talk about, not what they've asked me about. Sometimes it's good to keep my big mouth shut and get my ears out as well. When you go out of this place, are you showing the light of God in this world? I will be to work tomorrow and someone's bound to say, me, oh, what do you do over the weekend? And it's really easy to say, oh, I saw my mum and dad on Saturday and I oh, went out with saw some friends on Sunday. And I just bypass the fact I was at church, bypass the fact that I was talking about these things. Easy to do, isn't it? So are you prepared to go out there, shine the light of God, or would you walk out of church and say, right, that's it for another week, I can put that away? My final question, I guess the most important one is, as you sit there, are you really free, or are there things that are hindering you, helping you? Are there things that still enslave you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your Son into this world who would be the light of the world for us. That he came that we might know you, might know you fully, and that we might, by believing in him, have eternal life with you. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. And Lord, as we go from this place later on today, we just ask that our minds will be receptive to you guiding us to find the people you want us to talk to. That Lord, we will see people in this area hearing the gospel, hearing the word of God, knowing that there is a saviour waiting for them. And so, Father, we would ask that you would encourage us, make us bold, give us sensitivity, and just guide us to have the right conversations with the right people on the right basis. That, Father, we would truly shine your light in this dark world. Amen.